Thanks. I feel really boring here with the lectern and the notes and stuff, but you know, just pretend I'm doing something a little cooler. Um, it's really great to be here, uh, speaking to this room, which I know is full of people who are passionate about creating positive change in our musical community. Uh, I count myself among you in that regard, and I'd like to start this talk by allowing ourselves to reflect a little bit on all the positive changes that have already happened in this world of contemporary music that we all live in, and in musical practice since the turn of the century. It's funny to say turn of the century, because when I was growing up, like many of you, that probably meant, you know, borscht and pickles on the Lower East Side, or whatever your cultural equivalent is, but now we have to get used to this new world where the turn of the century means something that happened 15, 16 years ago. Um, you're going to hear some themes in my talk that are similar to Sarah's really moving speech, um, but I'm not from the Midwest, I'm from New York, so I actually enjoy hearing myself speak and talking about everything that's going on <laughs> in my head. Uh, you've probably heard a lot of doom and gloom, uh, I know I have, about the state of classical music and its fate, but this century so far has seen a really remarkable series of shifts in the relationship between contemporary classical music, new music, whatever you want to call it, and the wider culture in which it's situated. This shift has impacted not just contemporary classical music or even classical music in general, but has placed composers and new composition into a new relationship with our musical culture as a whole. And that new relationship likewise has the capacity to benefit everyone in the world of music, not just composers or classical musicians. It's really a sea change, and we're now only witnessing the first signs of how this new culture is going to look. That's a really important point, so I'm going to say it again. We're just at the beginning of this process, and everything we're talking about is a work in progress. Where we are now is not at all where we need to be, not even close. But we have to be able to talk simultaneously in terms of where we've come and where we're going. This is not an invitation to complacency, but it's actually meant to be an encouraging pat on the back so that we can get to where we need to go. One more preamble. I'm going to discuss ideas and resources and how changing ideas can change the way that resources are allocated. Resources like space, money, and institutional authority. I'm also going to talk about the cultural infrastructure that we have in place to support the ideas that we consider important. For example, we have an idea in our country that classical music is a cultural tradition that should be continued, and this idea has led to a massive continuous influx of resources to that end, as well as a robust infrastructure, educational and professional, to support that idea. When we worry about something like the death of classical music, we are not actually worried that this music is going to disappear. It's going to be around, presumably, for as long as any other part of our civilization. But we're worried that fewer and fewer people are going to believe that this idea, the idea of classical music being an important cultural tradition, is true. And if they don't believe it's true, they won't make decisions that lead to classical music continuing to receive the kinds of resources that it does. And the infrastructure will disappear. Popular ideas lead to resource allocation that supports the ideas themselves and a strong infrastructure for them. That's how it works. Ideas, resources, infrastructure. Rinse, wash, repeat. So with that all in mind, here we go. The biggest overarching shift that has occurred in the last 16 years is that Western classical music is now seen by those of us who are involved in perpetuating it as a living tradition as one vital, sophisticated, important music among many, not as the sun in the center of the musical universe. We've gone from a kind of post-Copernican to a pre-Copernican model, but in a good way. <laughs> if that sounds obvious to you, then great, don't leave, but great. It should be obvious, but it really was not always that way, as some of you may recall. Let's think about this idea, though, and consider its implications. When I was a student, a period that started in the 20th century and then ended in the 21st, the question of classical versus non-classical music was taken extremely seriously. There was this giant wall that had been erected to keep the barbarians out. It was built in the 19th century and then strengthened and widened and whatever else in the 20th until it became this massive edifice that seemed impermeable. The distinction between classical and non-classical was so important that if we wanted to call a music worthy of a certain kind of institutional respect or treatment, we had to find a way to fit it onto the right side of that classical-non-classical -classical binary. So jazz famously became America's classical music thanks to the great Billy Taylor and his effort to open up a space in American universities for jazz studies in the 1970s. You can certainly critique the impact that this move has had on the development of the art form, jazz itself, and a lot of people do, but it undeniably brought an influx of resources to musicians who very, very much deserved it, both in the universities themselves and from the legitimacy that it granted jazz musicians in the eyes of other cultural institutions like performing arts centers. 
By calling it classical music, jazz gained legitimacy and therefore resources like space, time, and money for its practitioners. Jazz was welcome to the palace, and it was good to be the king. So jazz was okay, but other music, not really. If you wanted to bring music from outside classical or jazz music into your own study and practice when I was a student, you had to justify it using the terms of classical music. I remember trying to argue for the legitimacy of all kinds of things, a rock song, a hip-hop track, whatever it might be, by saying, this is just as blank as classical music, just as harmonically or formally or sonically interesting and therefore worthy of our attention. Maybe this rings a bell for some of you. But what do we mean by classical? I think this is an interesting question. I would say that we meant music that is sophisticated, full of depth, attention to detail, music that was created to serve artistic, not commercial interests, music that was meant to be lasting and culturally significant. And as it turns out, of course, these characteristics are not uniquely found in notated Western music from 1100 on. It can be found in music from all over the world, from all cultures and traditions, in music that is termed popular or vernacular as well as classical, and it has nothing to do with the specific terms or features of Western classical music. This was as true, of course, in 1999 as it is in 2016, but the difference now is that many, many more people consider, in the classical music world, and especially more people in positions of cultural authority, consider this to be true and speak about music using, music, using those terms. And this is hugely important. On a basic human level, it's important because the presumption of classical music's primacy is, to be frank, a vestige of American and European colonialist and white supremacist history. Let's be honest with ourselves. In fact, that's practically the, de the definition of colonialist thinking, looking at other cultures through the prism of your own as superior. I'm raising an enormous subject here, one that goes far beyond the scope of what we can get into right now or what I'm qualified to talk about as an expert, but it has to be said that for all the boundary breaking and movement beyond genre, we still face the reality of a contemporary music scene and a classical music scene in general that is disproportionately represented by white men, like myself. This is a very important example of us not, not accepting this and not being self-satisfied despite all the positive changes that have happened. And I'd love to discuss this more in the future with anybody who, who's interested. For now though, I want to explain on a personal level how this important change I'm describing wound up playing out in the real world. I want to give you a little of my personal history, which intersects with the story I'm telling. From 2002 to 2004, I studied composition at the Yale School of Music. It was a wonderful education, but old-fashioned, despite from some forward-thinking people there. Composers were trained to be the kind of composers who wrote orchestral music and had academic jobs and lived their lives in the sequestered world of classical music. And meanwhile, most of the instrumentalists were trying to become famous soloists or not famous soloists or standard chamber musicians or orchestral players. As I said, it was a conservative scene and not one that was very open to music from, the, from outside of the classical world. Some of you may have gotten wind of this during the whole kerfuffle surrounding Yale Dean Robert, Robert Blocker and his dismissal of jazz studies, where he actually tried to unclassical jazz, suggesting that Yale shouldn't be expected to devote resources to, the, resources to that music because Yale's focus was squarely on classical music and not on jazz. He apparently didn't get the memo about America's classical music. Anyway, in my second year at Yale, a few composers and performers who had become friends decided that we should form together and regularly perform new compositions by these composers and by our friends. And a funny thing that happens in conservative places, I don't know if any of you have encountered this, is that all the proactive weirdos wind up finding each other and starting things. That's a good thing about being at a conservative institution. In this case, we formed a group called Now Ensemble, which is a seven-piece collective with five performers and two composers who don't perform, and then one of the performers is also a composer himself. It's, the instrumentation is flute, clarinet, electric guitar, double bass, and piano, and as you might guess, there wasn't exactly any standard repertoire from which we could draw for that instrumentation. So everything we played was newly written for the group. And the sound of the group was actually developed in a symbiotic relationship with those new compositions. Forming Now Ensemble was one of the best things that ever happened in my musical life, and I think the other members would all say the same thing. When you create your own performing, your, your own performing group, either as a composer or as a performer, it's an extraordinarily empowering act. It gives you the power to bring your music to people directly reflecting your vision precisely. You're saying, this is who I am as a musician, as a performer, as a composer. I stand behind this completely. The problem was, in 2004, nobody was really looking for this kind of group, and there was no clear path for us to take to get this music out to anyone. This was an ideas problem. At the time, there was very little support for the idea that a new ensemble dedicated to mu new music by young composers should be given a platform. 
Instead, we made our own way, building our own fan base and reputation through self-promoted shows for audiences initially made of our friends and colleagues and eventually growing as people heard about us and about the composers whose music we were performing. We were following a very common model, something Sarah alluded to as well. It's probably the most common model of career building for musicians outside of the classical community, but it wasn't common for a chamber music ensemble to do this, and we ran into the realities of why this was so right away. So what was this reality? Well, imagine you're a rock band that's trying to build your audience person by person, show by show, from the ground up. You're constantly on the road, performing at clubs and festivals and everywhere you can. It's a hard life, and hard as it is, let's, and please let's not glamorize that, it's an almost impossible existence, there's an infrastructure in place that can accommodate you. There are venues in most cities where you can perform, booking agents and managers who can guide you to those places, and audiences that will show up to those venues with at least a vague expectation that what they're going to hear is in line with what you're presenting. But this was not true for us. The infrastructure did not exist for this kind of chamber music. And because there was no infrastructure to, su to support our music, we had to invent one, playing in an incredibly wide variety of venues from museums and art galleries to libraries, coffee shops, elementary schools, high schools, and clubs and pubs. You may be wondering, what about concert halls? What about places like this? What about universities? We played there too, but hardly at first because we were young and no one who was in charge of these venues had ever heard of us. And if you're a young ensemble playing music by young composers, you have to build your own way. This is significant and is another shift. More and more young artists are choosing this route, opting to form their own ensembles and building musical careers that begin with the music they want to be making and then figuring it out from there, right? As opposed to, I'm gonna write for this already existing element in the classical music world and hope to gain access that way. I'm gonna start from the thing that I wanna be doing and then hope that it succeeds in the world on its own terms. You start by saying, this is who I am, this is what I wanna be doing, and then you convince the world that you're right. Many of these groups are led or co-led by composers like Balloon, which is read by Angelica Negron, Battle Chance, which is run by Travis LaPlante, or Teague, a percussion trio that writes most of their own music. I could pick a dozen, two dozen other examples off the top of my head, and there are hundreds more that are now developing that I don't even know about, which is incredibly wonderful. Some are traditional chamber ensembles, others are strange new combinations of instruments, like now ensemble. Some groups make the career-wise decision to commission or champion a famous composer, uh, like Alarm Will Sound did with uh, Ligeti, Reich, and Adams, or So Percussion did with David Lang, or the Jack Quartet, which is a wonderful string quartet uh, based in New York, did with the quartets of Yanis Sinakis. They all made their name by working with this famous composer's material, which gave them a reputation and freed them up to do other things later on. But if you don't do that, if you don't hitch your wagon to a famous composer or a famous name, then all you have is your music and your ability to get people to hear it. And this was the case for Now Ensemble, since when we recorded our first album in 2007, we didn't have any pieces by famous composers, only our own composers and our friends. And once again, I looked out at the classical music infrastructure as it existed at the time and saw that it was a system that would not give us the support that, they, that we needed. And so that's when I decided to start my own record label. Fortunately, it turned out that there were other people who were thinking about the same problem. And in 2008, New Amsterdam Records launched after a lot of work by the three co-directors, all composers, William Bertel, Sarah Kirkland Snyder, and myself. All three of us were in some stage of thinking about our own projects that the label could support, but they were all very different. Then we were joined on the label in our early days by an incredible array of artists, from composer ensembles like Missy Mazzoli's Victoire and Darcy James Argue's Secret Society, to ensembles that you've heard about in some of these talks, like Roomful of Teeth, who are here this weekend, or Y Music, to name some of our most successful releases. Our concept for the label was fairly simple. The projects we chose reflected what I've been describing as this new sensibility about music. Classical music, which was the world we all came from pretty much, classical, jazz, some sort of trained music, um, from, you know, Western and American traditions, the world we all came from was one vital, sophisticated, important music among many, but not the sun at the center of the mu musical universe. So we looked for projects that had strong connections to the jazz or classical tradition, but were open to all influences from all genres and styles of music. The records we released also had to succeed as records, not, as works of art that you could listen to on their own terms, not only as a reference for live performance or a calling card for the myriad talents of a composer or a ensemble. The point of our records was to be good records, which sounds obvious, and we felt would best serve the artists who made them in the long run, but many records that our peers were making at the time felt more like they were productions that were meant to be handed to a you know, faculty jury committee or stuck in a library somewhere as an important reference for your compositional voice. These were meant to be great records that people actually listened to and enjoyed in the world. 
If you make a great record, we believe, you create something that people will want to listen to, which is how you build fans for your art. Again, this sounds obvious, but it wasn't obvious to everybody that we were working with at the time. We also wanted the records to not only sound beautiful on their own, but to be able to stand up to other kinds of music that were in people's music collections from all genres and not disappear when you put it up to other types of music in your shuffle or your playlist, like so many other records do. This meant utilizing studio techniques in the recording process, like compression, multiple microphones, and various effects that most classical, classical record labels avoided. Traditionally, classical recordings were made by trying to pick the best spot in the concert hall and then simulating the experience of hearing the work live. We love the live experience, but we wanted, to, we wanted to encourage people to hear the record in the best possible terms for the record so that they would then come to the live performance and hear that live performance in its best possible uh, experience. So that meant we weren't trying to simulate something, we were trying to meet listeners where they were actually going to be hearing our music, in cars, in trains, walking down the street, working at their computer, or sitting at their hi-fi Dolby system with the music blasting their face and pulling their jowls back like in the commercial. And if they love the experience that they had with our music in any of those locations, they'd be more likely to come to have that best experience in the live concert hall or wherever else our music was found. We also spent time with the look of each record, working to help our musicians find visual artists whose work could complement their style and draw people toward what they had made. These kinds of considerations were all made with the real world in mind because the real world was where we wanted to find audiences for our music. New Amsterdam caught the attention of some significant critics and became synonymous with what was called the indie classical movement. That was a term we coined to try to capture the position we felt we were in, which was part of classical music history, but working outside of the main infrastructure of classical music to build our careers. Independent, indie, classical, classical. Unfortunately, that, that term wound up being misinterpreted as describing a particular sound, though nobody could ever quite decide what that sound was, because our, our label was releasing things from offbeat indie songs to jazz big band to solo viola to chamber ensembles to orchestral work and everything under the sun. It was a big tent. And that was exactly the point. New Amsterdam exists as a platform for people who are making extremely personal music, reflecting their personal taste. So of course all this music is not going to sound the same and there's no one sound of so-called indie classical music. We're not looking for a sound, we're looking for an approach to composition, to performance, to music making. What we meant by indie classical was real though, and that's important. It really was a real thing that was happening. And it was an important piece of the story and points towards our collective future. We weren't relying on the existing infrastructure of classical music to get our own music out into the world. We were building a new infrastructure that could serve us through the development of recordings that would then reach new audiences and make it possible for us to bring live music around the country and the world. And this worked. We opened up our music to people who would not previously have thought of themselves as fans of contemporary classical music, but enjoyed the music that we were bringing to their attention. Eventually, we were successful enough that it led to many existing established organizations and classical institutions to take notice and to allocate resources toward the music that we were creating and promoting. So in this case, it wasn't ideas leading to resources leading to infrastructure, but it was ideas leading to the infrastructure of New Amsterdam leading to, to resources being allocated to our community of musicians. And today, New Amsterdam serves as a hub, both uh, building a new infrastructure for contemporary music, but also helping musicians gain access to that existing infrastructure, including places like here at Depa, where we have an ongoing collaborative relationship. And many of the composers who have been associated with our label now have thriving careers that move between projects with institutional support, like orchestral commissions and the DIY projects that built their reputation on our label. The kinds of collaborations that New Amsterdam is engaged in are a critical new part of our mission and point towards a future that is full of new possibilities. Building off of that, and to close my talk, I want to suggest that it is our responsibility as a musical community to emphasize new collaborations, both as artists and institutions. Why collaboration and what kind? In 2010, I was asked to curate a new music festival in New York's Merkin Concert Hall. The concept I chose was to foster collaborations between artists from different musical backgrounds, genres, or scenes, and to have them present new collaborative work on each concert in the festival. For the last six years, we've done eight to 12 of these, each winter, and the results have been incredible. It's been a laboratory for various kinds of innovations, spawning new projects, and allowing older projects to take on new life. This is the Ecstatic Music Festival, and it's uh, still going strong every year in Merkin Concert Hall. There's so many highlights, and it's hard to even pick, but to choose a few examples, the songwriter John Darniel, who goes by the name Mountain Goats, worked with uh, the vocal group Anonymous Four to write a suite of songs for himself and them to sing. Uh, the Brazilian-American composer Marcos Balter wrote a piece for the band Deerhoof combined with Ensemble Del Niente. Meryl Garbus of uh, the band Tune Yards worked with Roomful of Teeth in one of the early years with a collaboration that's now gone back and forth um, and they've appeared on each other's albums in, in multiple ways and so on and so on. It's a laboratory where people are collaborating to make innovative new work. 
What I've learned from this series is that collaboration gives artists the freedom to try out new sides of their artistic personality while working with someone who can help foster that side of themselves. But it also allows artists to do what they do best while having that, that thing that they do best reflect in a new light through juxtaposition with another artist whose work is completely different. You might say that it's a safe way to be unsafe. There's real risk there, and we've had some shows that I'll admit did not work at all. Still, they're all interesting, and most of them have been great, and some have been truly life-changing for me as an audience member. Collaboration op opens up new opportunities for artists to open up new possibilities for audiences. Collaboration allows you to work outside of your comfort zone while doing what you do best, and because you're exploring new territory, you're able to learn about yourself, and you take something from the collaboration that lives with you long after that collaboration is over. You're changed from the experience. You grow. And we, as an artistic community, grow as a result. Interestingly, and here's where I'm going to end, the same exact principles apply to organizations. When I look around, I see institutions that are extremely well-intentioned and want to be part of the new ethos that I've been describing and so many other people here this weekend have also been describing. They believe that they should open themselves to different kinds of music and break down the barriers that have been received from previous generations. But how do you do that? How do you open yourself to this kind of change while remaining true to yourself as an institution? I believe that collaboration provides as much of an answer here as it does for artists looking to explore new territory. Every organization exists in a community, and often we want to reach new audiences from different parts of the community that we normally serve. I might be talking about a university that wants to bring in audiences from outside its student, faculty, and neighborhood population for a concert series, or an orchestra looking to reach younger and more diverse audiences, or a presenting organization that wants to expand its programming beyond strictly classical, but doesn't feel confident that people will come. The question is, how can your, your programming become a collaborative process? Who is in your community who you could ask about or even empower to make curatorial decisions? Your community is full of interesting people, and some of them are extremely knowledgeable about the local music scene or beyond. Who would they invite to work with a string quartet or, a, or in a choir with new repertoire? How would they respond to your new programming initiatives? What initiatives would they propose? This becomes especially interesting when you take a really close look at your community. And Dan Visconti gave some great examples in his talk yesterday of specific segments of his community that he engaged as part of a compositional project. Organizations can take the lead on this kind of community engagement, doing the work that Dan was describing, listening first, and then figuring out what kind of collaboration would serve both the community and the institution. It is scary to think about opening up your creative process as an artist, or your programming, or other decision-making processes as an institution. But if we're serious about the world we say we want to live in, one that is truly supportive of new ideas, we cannot allow our institutions to remain sequestered in their communities. We need a deep engagement, one that is a central part of the mission and philosophy that guides our institutional thinking. We need to recognize that the, the idea that we are all supporting of a new musical culture that has no walls or barriers between its practitioners requires an institutional commitment of tangible resources, time, space, and money to build a new infrastructure that will allow that culture to flourish. Our tangible commitment to the future, the future that we want to see, has to equal or surpass our commitment to the past. If you believe in everything that we've all been saying this weekend, then this isn't merely a choice, it's an obligation. Thank you very much.